Hi and welcome to the Arctic. My name's Jamie and I'm delighted to be here with Dr. Kerry Lewis. Hello. We are up here on AXA XL Arctic Live and we're currently at the UK Arctic Research Station in Neolison and that's the northernmost permanent community in the world. For the past week we have been braving the cold, the icebergs and the whales. Lots of whales. <laughs> to collect samples looking at the ocean chemistry, ocean acidification of the waters up here and also looking at some plankton and plastics and dragging nets behind us. In breaking news this morning we believe that a troop of polar bears has chewed through the internet cable um, here in the northernmost community in the world and that you may only be getting audio coming through to you. If that is the case we are terribly sorry uh, the polar bears did not know that this broadcast was taking place. We may talk about polar bears, but in fact, broadcasting from somewhere like Neolison is incredibly difficult. We currently do have a team searching to find out what the connectivity issues are. If they last for too long, we may not know where we are because most of the data that's coming from Neolison is actually mapping data that helps to calibrate the GPS system on which most of the world seems to rely on at the moment. So if you're driving this car, um, bumps into a lamppost, um, then it may be because the internet's not working up here. Uh, but we do hope uh, that you'll get some pictures through, but we are assuming that you can only get audio. We've got some great questions coming through. Before we start, I am just going to list some of the countries we've got oh, um, cool. schools from, and also then we'll have a chance to give some shout outs to some of the schools watching. So we have countries watching we have schools from the UAE, United Arab Emirates, the UK, Canada, Cyprus, Spain, a very early USA and Portugal and it's a big hello uh, from the Camden School for Girls in London, it's a big hello from the hey. Arctic back, hi. <laughs> um, uh, next shout out is hi Dr Kerry Lewis, we are a boys school in the north of Spain, our school is Colegio uh, Gaz Tuluata, my perfect Spanish accent well done, there. James. And some grade 9 and grade 10 students are participating in this live, live stream. We are sending you a big hello oh, and we hope you hello. can answer some of our questions. Uh, that's lovely. Um, we've got hello from Ronnie in Flintshire. Hello, Ronnie. Uh, enjoying the Arctic series so far. And we the last shout out is from Carlton Grammar School in East Devon. Oh. Very close to me. Hello. And looking forward to taking part in Arctic Live, and that is the Year 8 Geographer. So a big Arctic hello to all of you watching. Um, Kerry, before we start, a little bit of background before we leap into some of the questions. Uh, we first met um, <laughs> in the Arctic about eight years eight ago. Eight years ago, Eight Jamie. years ago now. Um, can you tell um, those watching a little bit about your current role and what your job entails? Yes, so I'm a marine biologist at Exeter University. I've been lucky enough to be to, uh, go to the Arctic a few times. This is my third time in the Arctic, but the first two times were eight and seven years ago where we were camping on the Arctic sea ice. So quite different from here where we're in a nice warm base. We were in tents that were unheated. So we would freeze, our sleeping bags would freeze. And to get out of our sleeping bags, you'd have to kind of get the ice off the zip to get out. But the questions we were asking were very similar to the questions we're asking here. We're looking at how the changing uh, chemistry of the oceans that's being driven by carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere but it also dissolves into seawater and it changes the chemistry of that seawater. It's called ocean acidification. And we want to know how much of that is happening in the Arctic and how it's affecting the marine life. So we did quite a lot of research eight and seven years ago, and now we're building on that research working here. So very similar questions. How is this changing chemistry affecting the tiny marine animals that live in Arctic waters? We're also looking at a new question this time about the microplastics. Brilliant. And so in terms of microplastics, we've been out with a net. Um, we've been trawling uh, we in have. the waters out here. Yes. So the way in which we look for microplastics is to trawl a plankton net through the water, which will collect both the plankton and anything else floating in that water. And most of the plastic should be floating on the surface. But 
as we've learned more about how plastic behaves in oceans, we know that actually it will start to sink. Little tiny things start to grow on the plastic, which start to make it heavier, and it will start to sink. But also bodies of water here in the Arctic move as they warm and cool. And there's quite a lot of warming and cooling in Arctic waters. And we think that's making some of the plastic sink. So we've also been sending these big bottles down to the deeper waters to collect water from the deep to see if we can find plastics there as well. It was all going very well, Jamie, until my net broke. So one of the big challenges of working up here where it's so cold is everything gets quite brittle and it breaks much more easily. And just on our last day, our plankton net ripped, probably because it just got too cold and the water is dense and heavy and it went straight through our net. But thankfully it was on the last day, so we've got most of our data. That's fantastic. And it, it's uh, very strange to think that even in this relatively remote environment that people would think is quite pristine that we are looking for plastic are plastics just everywhere unfortunately it does look like plastics are everywhere that we look for them we found them in the bottom of the mariana trench which is probably the most remote part of our planet um, but we are also finding them in the arctic and Ar antarctic waters but what's really interesting is this particular area of the arctic around svalbard it's actually looking like a hot spot where there's actually quite a lot of plastic. And we think that's because of the way in which plastic gets moved around by ocean currents. So there's a big current that goes out into the North Atlantic, where the North Atlantic gyre is. Mm -hmm. You might have heard of gyres. They're sort of circular currents that concentrate things in the middle. But then that gyre sort of shoots off, goes past the UK, and then comes up to Svalbard. So modelling studies suggest that plastic will be coming up in that current. And we're trying to look to see if we can see any evidence of that. But there's probably some more local sources as well. And that's part of what we're trying to figure out. And we did, did find a fishing net on the beach. We did, and yes. So, and a few other larger bits. And we were here last year and we did find microplastics in the water from our samples last year. I can't tell you what we found this year just yet. We have to take our samples back to the lab and do a lot of analysis because they're quite small pieces we're looking for. Um, so just to sort of put, pull him back, I mean, you're a research scientist, you're working on these very critical environmental issues. Has researching in the Arctic changed your perspective on anything? And if so, why? That's a really good as question. As Ethan. Ethan, very good question. The Arctic is a very special place to come and work. And the thing that makes me feel... Um, so moved when I come and work here in the Arctic is that it's a very brutal place. We have to take great care of ourselves when we're here. The cold doesn't just break plankton nets, it can break people. So we have to be really careful looking after ourselves. And yet this robust kind of brutal environment is actually also very sensitive to human influence. And for me, that kind of juxtaposition between something being really robust and hard and difficult and yet sensitive and being changed by our impacts, that's quite powerful. And you really feel that when you're here because you feel like the Arctic could, could you know, take you, but then you're influencing the Arctic as well. So it really makes you feel like humans are changing the planet. And do you, do you take any of the arc? Do you hold any piece of the Arctic in your heart, as it were, when you're when you're back home in the UK in in Devon, as it as it turns out? You, you, I think once you've been in the Arctic, it never leaves you, and its beauty absolutely stays in your memory. The light here is so special; it makes everything glisten. It's kind of magical. You get lots of rainbows sometimes because all the ice crystals in the air it's truly beautiful and you feel very privileged to be here because not many people can come this far north and work and see how beautiful it is so yes it absolutely always stays with you uh, a question now from hayden from college and grammar school Hi, hayden. Uh, hayden obviously uh listening a lot to the plastics piece in 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 the news um is wondering is there any hope we, we can achieve international laws banning the manufacture and import of single-use plastics since uh, this would reduce the quantity of microplastics in the ocean? It's a very good question and there's a lot of work being done by big governments all around the world. So at Exeter University we have been talking to the UK government, we've been talking to the EU Parliament and we've been to the UN to talk about the plastics research we've been doing to try and put the right sort of laws in place to control the amount of plastic being used. I'm not sure that one single international law is possible, but there's a huge push from countries all around the world to reduce the amount of plastics going in the ocean. Now, I'm not sure that a ban on all single-use plastics is the right thing to do, 
because sometimes single-use plastic actually is the best product. We have to be very careful, but there's a lot of unnecessary plastic we can absolutely cut from our lifestyles. And I don't think we need the laws to change it. We can take that action ourselves in how we shop and the things that we buy and the way in which we live our lives. And just driving down, I mean, you, we're, we're talking about, you know, necessary and unnecessary single-use plastic. Exactly. You mentioned that in, in general. What would an example of what you think is important single-use plastic might be? What, yeah. what, what, so, what... for example, in the medical world, okay. um, if you're having an injection, you want that to be a very sterile injection. And if we were to make them out of glass, then the carbon footprint of that would be really high. So, actually, there's a single-use plastic where it's the best sustainable product for something that prevents infection. But there are so many ways in which we are using single-use plastic where we really don't need to be using it. And those are the items we need to be targeting. And are we, are we talking about sort of food and drink as some of the main um, sort so of So the biggest, culprits? yes, biggest um, items that we find on beaches, and I've worked on this all over the world. I've also just come back from Galapagos on the equator, about as far away from here as it's possible to get. Um, and we found a lot of drinking bottles there. Now, in Galapagos, they don't have safe drinking water, so that's actually quite difficult to fix. But in the UK and many other countries, we are lucky enough to have really safe drinking water from the tap. We don't need to buy it in single-use bottles. Um, and and, it's, and you, we, we talk about to what extent, you know, it, it's our own, you know, problem and we have to take on responsibility and we have to make change on our own level versus asking the government to make a wider change on our behalf. Do you, is, it, is it something that we should follow both or Absolutely. Roots? So, yes, there are lots of actions you can do on a daily basis that will have really quite a big impact. For example, carrier bags. Since we had a 5B carrier bag charge in the UK, the amount of carrier bags being used has dramatically reduced. And we can see that in our sampling in the marine environment now. Mm -hmm. The amount of plastics bags we're finding has gone down. Small change big impact on the amount of litter going in. So those little little changes that you can do at home do add up to help the ocean. But also we definitely need big supermarkets and food packaging companies and lots of other companies to really get on board and think about how they are selling us their products because there's so many things that can be changed. But certainly from the projects I'm involved in, I can those conversations are happening. So there's a lot to be positive about. Brilliant. Um, question coming here, sort of... We read about this microplastics thing. This is a question from Isaac at Collison. Where are microplastics mostly found in the ocean waters and are they quite evenly distributed? That's a really good question. And actually, we've only just started to realise that microplastics are not just on the surface of the oceans. So the microplastics are mostly tiny fragments of plastic that have been broken down from larger okay. items like your drinks bottle or other plastic containers. They get broken down when they're floating around in the ocean by the UV action, the action of the wave. They get more and more brittle and then they just break down into smaller and smaller pieces. And we think they keep on just getting smaller and smaller until they are nano sized. Um, but we can't measure them that small yet. But we have lots of modelling studies to suggest that they will get that small. But as they're floating around and they're getting smaller, they will then start to change their buoyancy, whether they float or sink, because they will get colonised by microbes. There's so many microbes in seawater and then they'll start to get heavier and they sink. So for decades, we've been measuring the surface microplastics, trawling our nets on the surface without really thinking about what's sinking and going into the sediment at the bottom of the sea. But we know that actually that now could be where most of the microplastics is. We've only looked in sediments in a few places in the world, and this still is a big question we're trying to find out. But we certainly know that they are in the sediments when we look for them, so they're probably all throughout the water column. Amazing, absolutely frightening to think. Yes. Uh, a quick technical question to clarify for, yeah. for our classes watching. How big is a microplastic and how big is a nanoplastic? Well, we can't even agree on that as scientists <laughs> at the moment. There are two definitions currently going around. One is that a microplastic is five millimetres and smaller. OK. But there's a new definition where people say it should be one millimetre and smaller. Okay. So there's a little bit of a split in, in the scientists at the moment. Um, the traditional one is five millimetres and smaller. OK. And that was defined by when it gets small enough for organisms to eat it that are in the plankton, rather than it being the proper definition of micro, because five millimetres yeah, is bigger than micro. Yes. 
but it's the size range at which it becomes what we call bioavailable, available for biology to eat it. Okay. So that's where that definition came from. And the nano? Oh, now, now you've put me on the spot. Nano is when it's too small for us to be able to see it, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's because what, I mean, what I've heard your, you and other scientists talk about is not just being able to eat it and it passing through the gut, but also being absorbed into tissues. Into tissues. That's right. Now, a particle bigger than about 10 microns is probably too big to go through. A micron through. is a millionth of a metre. That's right. Okay. It's probably too big to pass through the stomach wall, and it would hopefully go straight through the gut and out in the poo. Yep. And we've measured that in the lab. We've fed some tiny zooplankton called copepods with beads, and we watch it go in, and you can see it go through their tummy, and then they poo it out. But we are a bit worried that when the plastics get really small, they can then start to pass through the lining of the tummy and go into the tissues. Now, that's when it might start to accumulate in an organism. Yeah. We've done that in the laboratory when we can dye the tiny, tiny particles and see where they go. We don't know yet if that actually happens in the real world because we cannot measure them when they're that small yet. But there are lots of very clever people in the world developing new technologies for measuring nanoplastics to see if this really happens. Wow, so it's, it's all happening now? Absolutely. It's a rapidly moving field of research. Lots of scientists all over the world doing lots of great work to look at this important question. Um, we've had a quick two... Uh, a couple of shout outs have come through while, while, while we've been going through the questions, and that's from the Grammar School in Nicosia and from Bobadella School in Portugal. So Hello. hi to all the students watching there. Um, just to take a question from Colegio um, Gastruata School in Spain. Uh, you're going to have to put up with this, I'm afraid, for the whole of the call. Um, why do you think your job makes a difference? Well, I'm very lucky in that I get to combine research on really important global questions with teaching and talking to people like you. And I talk to government as well. So I've recently been in meetings with DEFRA, which is the UK environment um, organisation that makes the policies. I got to meet the man who wrote the microbead ban policy for the UK. So us getting to talk to them means things actually get changed in law. But I also get to teach the next generation of students to live differently and to be better global citizens. So I get to find things out and then I get to make people behave differently as a result of finding those things out, which is just the coolest thing ever. Amazing. And and how did you get to be in this career? How do you get to have this amazing, I'm going to the Arctic, Galapagos, teach some students, change national policy, inspire, <laughs> etc.? Et well, um, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, a lot of um, fortuitous events, I think, but a real passion for asking questions about how the marine environment works. It's what's driven me the whole time. I started off rock pooling as a kid and just loving all the weird things you find in rock pools. There's so many fascinating little creatures. So I started off just wanting to understand them, how they live in these crazy environments. How do they live and survive and grow in a rock pool or a deep part of the ocean? But then I realised very quickly that actually if you want to study an organism in its environment you now have to take into account the changes in its environment because there is no such thing as a pristine ocean anymore so we have to look at how our influences on the ocean affect these organisms ability to live and I've just pursued that question and been lucky enough to get positions in fantastic universities where I've been allowed to follow my my dream of asking these questions and sometimes you just get a phone call saying, do you want to come to the Arctic? <laughs> and you just have to be brave enough to say yes. Amazing. Uh, so looking at this is from Molly, um, Molly C at Colleton Grammar. Um, was there anyone who, I and mean, we talked about rock pools, but was there a, a particular person that inspired you um, early on? Um, I think I, I've been lucky enough to have been taught by some real enthusiasts. So I did my PhD with Professor Peter Olive who was a worm guru. And he was so in love with the worms that he was studying. These are marine worms, which tend to live in the sediment on the bottom of the sea. He loved them so much, whenever he talked about them, he danced like a worm. He would wiggle as he talked. And I just thought that that was so cool, that he loved these tiny weird creatures so much that he was so excited when he talked about Brilliant. them, that that was a real inspiration for me. But there have been many people equally in love with what they study that have always made me feel very excited to work with them. Wonderful. And for, for those students watching, looking to have a similar career, what advice would you give them? 
Well, first of all, you do need to study hard. Marine biology is quite competitive, but there are lots of things you can do just to get experience at, at working in the marine environment. You can go and volunteer. There's lots of marine charities, depending on where you are in the world, where you can go and just maybe spend a week working with them or do a summer placement, anything to actually get a little bit of hands-on experience. Yeah. When I was 18, I did something called Coral Key. There's okay. lots of similar things where you get to sign up to go and do some survey diving. Uh, I was lucky enough to do that in Belize. And whilst the data that you collect isn't the sort of thing you would publish in a scientific paper, it all helps the government um, set up marine protected areas. But in terms of the learning that I got on that trip, I had to pay. Yeah. So, you know, it's not cheap. There are some placements that get um, sponsored. But uh, the experience of just being in the sea, learning how to survey, learning how to identify different things was hugely invaluable. Amazing. Um, and it's it's sort of a long journey um, from the classroom to where you are now, but not too long. <laughs> um, but um, th thinking about sort of just a wider piece and talking about that section of your work where you're helping to inspire and raise awareness of these issues, whether it's through um, your teaching or through talking to government, um, what advice would you give to uh, students from Spain in particular, but probably more widely, mm. who would like to spread awareness about the issues that you are working on, such as microplastics in the oceans and waterways? I think there's uh, certainly for microplastics, there's so much that you can do where you live and work or go to school. So, for example, if you're at school, how is your school using plastic? Is there a little campaign that you can set up to improve the way your school uses plastic? Are you recycling everything? Are you still being given plastic straws with your drinks? Can you start a little campaign to change that and stop people using straws, for example? And little campaigns, when they're done well and you share them on social media, can actually bring about big change. Beach cleans are another really great thing. It's actually quite good fun. Um, and you're also removing the plastic from the environment, which is totally worthwhile. You're removing the amount that's going to get washed into the sea. And again, if you get to the local newspapers, maybe even talk to your local radio about what you're doing that's positive action, then you start to spread the message. I would definitely say doing is important, though, because there's a lot of awareness now around the world of plastics, but we're still not actually changing our behaviour enough. So try and actually do something some kind of action rather than just talking about it. I think that would be really powerful. And you were talking last night about uh, organising a silent disco beach clean. That's just because I like dancing, Jamie. I like the idea of dancing around the beach picking up litter. But making these things fun obviously will bring more people in and get them to buy into what you're trying to do much more. So whether it's a silent disco or another um, melding of fun and conservation, uh, try and come up with some great ideas where you are and then put them into action the time for awareness raising is over. Well, I think but it's on, on its own. I think we do need action to follow up what we know. Um, quick question: What is your which is your favourite ocean region and why? Oh, it's so hard. I've been so lucky to go to some fantastic places, but I think my heart really... Well, I'm in the Arctic now, so I'm going to say the Arctic. When I was in Galapagos a few weeks ago, I probably would have said Galapagos. There's just so much life in both of these um, places and, and you put a net in the water and every time they'll be like, oh, what's that? And that's my favourite feeling ever. Um, so, yeah, any anywhere I can stick my, my plankton net in and see something weird, I'm very happy. <laughs> Brilliant. And, and additional whales or sharks? <gasps> or... Yes. So we very lucky this morning, we went down to the pier to collect one of our little experiments that was dangling off the pier and there were about 50 beluga whales swimming around the pier. <gasps> That was amazing. My heart's still going from that. Very, very Brilliant. beautiful. Brilliant. Um, follow up is really sort of about you know how research works, and, and we spoke earlier um, about being at an international sort of science village up here. Um, do you work with scientists from different countries, and is there a difference between each country's research, and is that good or bad? That's a very good question. I've worked with um, people from a few different parts of the world. Not all over yeah. the world but certainly we are looking at uh, addressing global questions these are global change questions we are trying to address so it really is important to try and bring in um, scientists from around the world to work on these together yeah. so I've been lucky enough to be on some some quite big projects um, with uh, scientists from from America um, from I'm trying to think now from Galapagos um, Canada um, certainly the Arctic, we've been working very closely yeah. with Canadians and Norwegians because they're, they're actually in the Arctic. Um, and you do need those, those big 
collaborations to actually ask these big questions. But also we need to work with people from different disciplines. So I'm a marine biologist. I work on the biology of the oceans, but that we need to understand the currents and the chemistry and what's happening in the atmosphere. So you need to work with scientists studying those. So interdisciplinary research is really important because uh, there's no barriers in global change, Jamie. So we need to actually break down the barriers between us as scientists to ask these questions. And also there might be an experts in different countries and we need to have the best, the best brain sort of, you know, yeah. around the world wherever they might be but the scientific method holds true wherever you're working the the idea of getting repeatable data that's been collected robustly those are the two key words repeatable and robust um, and that principle holds true so people will have slightly different um, expertises but that's good it means you get the bigger picture more readily and so going from global um, collaboration to solve our global challenges to what is your favorite marine animal and oh. why Oh, I change my mind every time you ask me this question, Jamie. Yes. I think um, today I'm going to say a pteropod. A pteropod? A pteropod, which is a little marine snail that's yeah. lost its shell. So they have the shell when they're babies and then they, they crawl out of it when they become adults. And then they swim around like a butterfly. They have these beautiful wings and they kind of flap around the water. And they're very important sort of bottom of the food chain animals here, which the larger fish and whales will eat. But they are beautiful. And vicious. Well, they can eat smaller zooplankton, so they are predators as well. But they don't look like predators; they're too pretty. They do have devil horns, but there we go. We'll, <laughs> we'll leave that. We'll leave that out. Um, um, from Spain, we have when you are doing field research in the Arctic. Um, what do you usually do in a normal day? What does a normal day look like? Well, I, I'll tell you what we've been doing this last week. Yeah. So, normal day is to get up and instantly put on lots of thermal layers trudge over to the mess hall for a good breakfast because you've got a long day ahead food is fuel yeah. you've got to have a good a good breakfast and then we've been going out on the boat at about sort of half past nine ten o'clock and then we've been going out to the different parts of the fjord and then trawling and collecting water samples and that actually takes most of the day because we've got to put the nets um, up and down to the different depths and we've got to do lots of surface trawls so most of the day we've been out on the boat and then we bring back the samples, make sure they are stored properly and we've labelled everything. And then it's time to get a good uh, bit of dinner in. Um, and then just make sure that our lab books are up to date in the evenings and we've recorded everything we've done that day. And then get a good sleep because you've got to do it all again the next day. And, and what have been some highlights of the sampling so far this year? Well, I have to say, just working with the fantastic team that we've got here, it's been great fun. Uh, a good sort of positive attitude when you're out on a freezing day makes a big difference you, i reckon you, it makes 10 degrees of temperature difference when people are laughing and smiling around you and not being sad that it's really cold um but also just this place is so beautiful it takes your breath away every time you look up from your plankton net there's a beautiful iceberg floating past um so yeah you, you don't get bored of how pretty it is so as long as that iceberg isn't too close yes jamie got a bit scared when one came too close to the boat <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say I was the only one watching it to try and make sure it wasn't crashing was, into the boat. I was doing the science, Jamie. Yes, so um, a, a foot away um, was closer than um, <laughs> was comfortable. Um, what uh, tools do you use for your research? Well, we've talked about the plankton net already, which is now shredded, but hopefully we'll be able to fix that when we get home. But that's a very important tool. So we did bring spares. So thankfully, um, we have lots of plankton nets to collect those samples. Then we also need what's called a Niskin bottle. Okay. Now, a Niskin bottle is a special water sampling bottle because it can take water samples at discrete depths. Do you imagine if you put a net all the way down to the bottom and then brought it to the surface, it would be sampling that whole water column because you'd just be dragging it through all of the different okay. depths. So you couldn't separate out which depth your sample had come from. So a Niskin bottle is really great because it's like a big tube and you send it down open as a big tube and then you close it at a certain depth so you know that sample has come from that depth and you haven't changed it when you've brought it to the surface so that's a really important piece of kit for us those are the two most important things that we and have they're, they're pretty well robust i want to say but they no no sort of motors or electronics or anything fancy and, and that's no. probably quite good yes up here. and they they did freeze on our first day they were mm. quite frozen and we still managed to work them so they're very good bits of kit um this coming uh through from the grammar school nicosia is uh do you investigate how plastic waste at sea is carried by the currents? I don't personally. What my job is, is looking at how it might be influencing the biology, the animals in the sea. But 
I talked about working interdisciplinary. We're working with a fantastic modeler who does that work for us. So we give him the data of what we've measured when we've been out, and he then works the ocean currents and puts that into models. Okay. So again, that's where interdisciplinary research, working with other people with other skills, really helps ask these questions. So Eric yes. is, is busy working on those models for us. And um, because I mean, the follow-up question is, is the interest here is from waste traveling from overpopulated to less populated areas. And we, we there's lots of debate and, and some misconceptions in, in the media about where plastic waste in the ocean comes from and where it's generated from. Can you clarify just on a... Well, I, it's a very complicated thing to look at. Okay. When you find a bit of plastic in the sea, you can't sort of say, oh, that's definitely come from, you know, because the plastic wears down. But also people move plastic with ships. So if a label says it was made in China, it doesn't mean the bottle went into the sea in China. Somebody could have put it on a ship, travelled across the world and lost it somewhere else. So that's actually very difficult. What we do know is that there is lots of plastic coming down um, certain rivers. And so we know that those are a bad source. But there's so much other plastic that we don't know where it's come from. We're using these models to sort of track where it's most likely to have come from. Okay. But it's a really difficult question to look at. And I think... The way in which we are improving, the ways we can look at plastic and, and measure plastic, hopefully soon we'll be able to get better at asking those questions. But all we can say at the moment is it's this size, it's of this polymer, it's probably come from an item. Really hard to say where that item was put in the sea. And is, is it important? I mean, why are these questions important to be able to answer where, where, where it's come from? It feels a bit like a blame game. Well, we need to know if um, what we can do to reduce it. So Got if it. we know, you know, what item it was, that's a start. And we can yeah. kind of get close to that at the moment. Oh, it's probably a plastic bottle. Let's all get better at not using plastic ah, bottles. Okay. But if it's come from a country where there's no safe drinking water, then actually we need to do something more than just tell them not to use bottles. We need to help them get safe drinking water. So there's a lot of very complicated things we have to think about. Um, so it's not a blame game, but if we want to change this, we need to get an idea of what is causing the problem. That's, I mean, really interesting to shift that way because it's some of the, the headlines you get do feel like they're sort of yes. point, pointing, pointing. And we fingers. find a lot of litter on our beaches in the UK. We find a lot of beaches on uh, litter on beaches in Galapagos where nobody goes because it's a protected area. So you know, you can be miles apart in the ocean, very different societies, and you're still finding the same items on beaches. Sad to think about. Um, how much plastic is from the grammar school again how much plastic do you collect from oceans during something i mean is it plastic bags you drag up in the nets i mean what, what, what does it look like so here we are only really finding the really tiny bits i'm not seeing any big plastic bags floating i did some work in the azores and the azores is right on the edge of the north atlantic gyre and there we were seeing all sorts of big things floating around so it really does depend on where you are as to the type of plastics Lots of big old containers and rope from fishing gear and plastic bags, all sort of floating around on the surface. And they've clearly been in the sea for a long time because they have things like barnacles growing on okay. them. They have little communities of animals growing on them, which means they've been in the sea for quite a long time. So it is different depending on where you are looking for the plastic. But like I say, beaches, you tend to just find lots of bottles and, and broken down bits of um, cans and things. A follow-up question um, to one of your earlier comments, which was talking about your Niskin bottle freezing yes, uh, and various other things freezing. How, how do you get around that? <sighs> well, we've had a few um, different ideas. So, um, for example, things with batteries. The batteries yeah. tend to go flat very quickly when it's cold. But, you know, we've got lots of lovely clothes on, so you can shove, shove your GPS in, down your jumper and that will warm yeah. it up and it will work. Um, we've had a kettle on board the boat, which was brilliant for defrosting the Niskins. Right. But what's interesting, and maybe um, the people listening don't realise, that the air temperature here is colder than the sea. So normally you think of the sea as being cold, but here actually it's warmer than the air. So with our frozen Niskins, all we had to do to defrost them was put them in the sea and they defrost. And then, But then the strange thing for me is that the sea then freezes below freezing so because it's got salt, the ah. freezing point is lower. It's about minus 1.8 degrees. And it's really stable. The surface uh, seawater will be a really stable temperature. Um, it's a little bit above that here um, because we're not in the middle of winter now. We're starting to go into summer. So it's about one and a half degrees. 
That was warmer than the air, which was minus 10 degrees that day. So defrosting things by putting them in the sea. It's a bit counterintuitive, but it works. And then the wind chill brought that. What was the feel like on that first day at something? That's right. So the wind here really makes a difference to the air temperature. And on our first day sampling, it was quite windy. And so the wind chill was minus 25. And that's when everything starts freezing really quickly. So we, we had all sorts of things freezing, but we managed to keep warming them up and keep working. Oh, my nose was a bit cold, but it's actually my fingers. Yeah. Because you're dealing with the, the seawater coming out of your net and out of the bottles. And so your fingers get really cold. That's actually quite painful, but um, it was okay. And uh, this is obviously a lot warmer uh, than the last time you were in the Arctic. What temperature is too cold <laughs> to sample at? Oh, well... The last trip that we did when we were camping, and most of the days it was minus 35 to minus 40, we were able to sample, but only because we had a little tent over our sampling hole. We had a hole in the sea ice that we were putting our net through then, and we had a little heater in there just to try and stop everything freezing. So that was okay, but only because we had a little bit of heating. Um, but we did have a day when the wind really got up and the wind chill factor then was minus 70, which is not safe to be out in at all. So that day we had to spend in the mess tent drinking tea and playing Scrabble. <laughs> minus 70, that, that's pretty chilly. So your, your skin freezes in about 20 to 30 seconds at that temperature, so it's not safe to be out at all. Right, this, this well, well, yeah. I, I got my, my nose that went, I don't know if you had... Frost nip. Just a little bit on my cheeks, and that's because you try to have your hat right down and then you have a, a scarf right up, but there was a little gap, and so my cheeks got a little bit sore. Um, and um, going going from that back back to the big sort of plastics issue is that um, sort of comments coming through is that there's a lot of information out there, uh, and a lot of information online now that students can just go online, they can sort of re research things, uh, but is that, is that reliable and where can students get reliable information from? That's a very good question. I've certainly seen quite a few stories in the media that aren't quite right. Sometimes it gets a little bit wrong and it's very hard to find good sources of information but that's why we put resources together to share good information and if you um, look at who is writing the information that's always a good sense. Try and go straight to the scientist. Lots of scientists now use Twitter and do blogs and go on YouTube and make little videos. So then it's straight from the horse's mouth and it, it won't be misinterpreted. Plastics is such a hot topic. Everybody is desperate to talk about it. And sometimes it, it gets a little bit wonky with the facts. But at the end of the day, we all just need to reduce the amount of plastic we are using. I, mean, I think that's, that's a very good point at the end is that uh, some people try to unpick the whole plastics uh, piece because somebody may have put out something that's, you know, unverifiable even if it's not wrong it's just something we, we don't quite know yeah um but might be true and then try and unravel the whole of the plastics piece because of that single fact but that that's not the case it is a big issue and we do need to take action that's right um uh, any scientists apart from your good self that we could put a twitter handle out for on uh, the live feed for students to follow um, I'm trying to think of good tweets. Amy Lusher is working in Norway, so not that far away from here. She does some fantastic stuff. She was looking for plastics in walrus poo. Uh -huh. so she'd be a great person to follow. There's um, Matt Cole in Plymouth, who yes. also works on zooplankton. He does some great tweets. Um, there's a lot of very good people. We, we can put some... We can put, put a list yeah, together. We can put a list together for fantastic. you. Fantastic. Um, and... Uh, Moving on from the, that particular issue, looking at your wider experiences across your uh, science career, um, what has been your experience as a, as a woman in science? Oh, um, well, I don't think it makes any difference. <laughs> but sometimes um, I work with a lot of younger uh, female scientists who are trying to build their careers. And the one thing I do see regularly is they're a little bit more nervous to stand up and talk about what they do than the male students that I work with. And that makes me sad because there's no reason for that. They're just as great. Um, they tend to be just a bit more shy and a bit more nervous about giving talks. And in science, quite often, the way to get noticed and to get your facts that you found out shared across the world is to give a talk. And that can be quite daunting. Um, so my number one tip for, for any young female scientists out there who really want to um, sort of further their career is get a bit more confident at talking about your science. And the best way to do that is to give talks to your housemates, to your lab mates, to your mum and dad. The more you practice giving talks, the less scary it gets. And, and it's 
it's still a bit I get nervous still giving talks but you get much better at it and it is an important part of being able to to be a scientist is to communicate what you've done um but I, other than that I, I think there's there's no issues at all Jamie no no issues at all uh, so to, to to all those um young women watching uh is is that we need a diverse range of people very important yeah and and that you know there are some brilliant women out there who are just not telling us they're brilliant because they're too shy to talk so please talk fantastic message there um my students um from guys to Luasa college in spain would love to participate in field research do you ever need volunteers Aww. and especially in the arctic please <laughs> Oh, I wish I could take you all to the Arctic. Unfortunately, airfares are quite expensive, aren't they, Jamie, to get here? Well, I mean, or, I mean, unfortunately, we're, we're, yes, and, and limited space um, on the station. Um, but there are some fantastic citizen science projects going on. So do look online to see if there's anything that you can um, add to. For example, there's a marine debris tracker app. Okay. So you can go and do a beach clean, and then you can add all of your data to the marine debris tracker app. And then yeah. you're adding to a global data set on plastic. That's really important. There's something else called pellet watch. So there's the tiny little nerdles. They're the pre-production pellets. What get okay. shipped around the world to the factories that then make our plastic items. They're, they're sometimes called mermaid's tears, but I think that's far too romantic to call plastic waste mermaid's tears. But there's a, a thing called pellet watch where if you collect them with um, some tweezers and put them in tin foil, so you're not contaminating yes. with them in your hands, you send them off to pellet watch, then they will measure the contaminants on the plastic and add that to a global data set. So anyone can add to these big global data sets and help just from um, wherever they're seeing plastic. Amazing. So there's a chance to be uh, citizen scientists, maybe work up to coming and doing some field research in the Arctic. So maybe not the first first a bit of field work you do um but work, working up to to being out here and what tips would you give what makes good field work you mentioned robust and repeatable before yes. like i say it's very important to um, have a process for how you're collecting your data and i think good field work is simple things done well because things go wrong as we saw with our plankton net ripping and, and it being so cold and kit freezing you need simple questions you just need to take lots and lots of measurements the same to to get nice robust data so repeated measurements done exactly the same every time is is the ultimate key to good field work um, but always keep things simple because doing field work it, the challenges always come up when you're doing field work especially somewhere where everything freezes brilliant and that's something that students